federal area. So how many of you have been to the beach in Summerlin, across from the big yellow house? You know that big yellow house that used to be, I think, they used to have witches in there. I heard the rumor. It's a coven. Really? You remember the big yellow house? Yeah. Anyway, this is across from there. This is what, California in Summerlin, you'll see there's a plaque when you pull into that parking lot uh, commemorating the, the um, first offshore drilling was done right here off of Summerlin. These are really kind of, they're not platforms, but they're piers that are built out with wooden derricks. And this was actually right there, if you look down over the cliff there, this was where this was back then. It's obviously not there anymore. But it was the first offshore drilling in the world that occurred right here in off of Summerlin. And if you do some silly Googling around, the folks in the Gulf of Mexico will say they were the first. This was actually the first. So. And, and there were three platforms later right offshore here, called, or four, called the 4-H. Four and they were real close to shore, and they were abandoned, completely abandoned a while back. So this is an asphalt pit, um, Santa Barbara County. I mean, there's so much oil and hydrocarbons in Santa Barbara County that, as your professor knows, they ooze out of the ground. Uh, that's really where oil was discovered out here was by looking at it who's out of the ground. And so they're digging this asphalt up and at one point all of the roads in Santa Barbara County and other places in California were paved out of these, these asphalt pits. I believe this one, if I'm not mistaken, I think this one's where present day UCSB. Yeah, I think that's right. Our early roads, so there you go, yeah, 1890s. Now this, moving up the coast, this is a little later in time. These are metal. Similar concept, though, where they're just building them out. This is up uh, off of uh, Coal Oil Point, up, up by where UCSB is today and all of that. Uh, this was a later version of this. These are all gone as well. And this, how many of you know uh, Santa Barbara? How many of you know the place called the Mesa? This is the Mesa. I used to actually live. <laughs> I used to actually live right in right in here. Um, and the road I lived on, how many of you know Spanish? I only know un poquito. Uh, there was a, a road there. It was called Calle Cortita. What does that mean? Short road. The little road, no sides. It was went out to the the well drilling manager's hut out there. But this was in the this was there over uh, uh, the mesa. So this is this 1930s? Yeah, I think that's uh -huh. about right. All gone. Now presently, off the coast of California, there's 23 platforms in federal waters and there's four in state waters. There's also five islands, five man-made islands, and I'll show you a picture of two of them. So they are, to some degree, they're either producing or they're decommissioned. There's a, that map again to show you where these platforms are. They're set by where the oil is. So in the Pacific OCS, that's not in state waters, that's beyond three miles. 20 of the platforms are producing oil and gas. One is a processing facility and two are currently in the process of decommissioning. Abandoning. Six companies operate those platforms altogether. The biggest operator is a company called DCOR, Dos Quadros Offshore Resources. And they bought 11 platforms from a company called uh, Torch a while hmm. back. And Torch had assembled them all together. They, Torch had 14. They sold 11 to Decor. They sold three, the three you can't see that are, once you go, when you're going up the coast past Santa Barbara, before you get to the tunnel, you pass a couple of platforms. Those are Exxon's platforms. Beyond, out of eyesight, there are three more platforms way out there, and that's what that processing facility that you see was built, was to process that oil. And those three platforms, in addition to the other 11, were originally all owned by the same company, but now they're owned by a company called Freeport McMoran, which actually does more mining than anything else. Hmm. And um, So where's Decor headquartered? Uh, they're in Dallas, but they've got an office in Ventura, and they got one over in Bakersfield. So... There's some production. So California State Waters, remember, that's three miles in. Total active leases was 14. The average production as of March 2017 was 7,087 barrels of oil equivalent per day. 
That's average from each of the leases or that's from the all 14 combined? That was all 14 combined okay. per day. And so barrel of oil equivalent means there's a calculation for that they take natural gas that's produced and they equivalent, make it equal to a barrel of oil so that they can come up with that combined number. That's what that's about. In federal, they're, it's interesting, I'm a little confused because this data I dredged up and now it, uh, when I went on BOEM today, uh, yesterday it said 34 active leases, so I'm not quite sure what what's that about, whether that number doesn't reflect those two Venicos, et cetera, but I'll research that. So just know that that 43 number might not be quite accurate. If you want to learn a lot more about the Pacific offshore production, uh, go on the website uh, called Bureau of, of Energy, Bureau of Food and Energy Management, BOEM, and uh, click the Pacific region, it tells you all kinds of stuff. And then, so in the counter outer continental shelf, beyond three miles, you can see this reflects the impact of the shut-in of those platforms. 2014, there was 50,648 barrels per day. It's dropped down to 16,831 in 2016 per day. So that oil's coming from somewhere because we're not, not using it. And we all know where it's coming from, right? Offshore. So how big are the platforms? All the platforms that are off the coast are all what are called fixed leg platforms. They're anchored to the bottom of the ocean. And nowadays, they've got all kinds of things. In the Gulf, you might recall when you saw some of the, when the storms and the hurricanes were coming, uh, one of the platforms floated and crashed into the beach or something. They're basically can float, tether to the bottom, a variety of things now. They can move ships in and keep them in position with GPS so they can drill. So fixed platforms are really not the thing of the present, but they have been the thing of the past, and all of them off the coast of California are fixed leg. And some of them are 1,200 feet tall. And that is taller than the Empire State Building. That's a kind of a, I did that, give you an example. <laughs> the Empire State Building, I think, is 1,100 and some feet. So platform harmony. So what you see is what's called the plus 15 deck. See this line right here, that's, that represents the ocean. Basically, you see everything above that. The rest of that's below. And the reason I want to emphasize that is because um, these platforms have become contained ecosystems, if you will, for lack of a better term. I guess that is probably the best term. So here I go, I jumped ahead of myself to tip the iceberg. So there's the platform in reality, and there is a schematic of what is below. Now they bring those things in in sections, and I actually got to see platform hondo being put in. They brought pieces of it in a bar or barges, and they would drop it off and sink it down, and then they bring the next piece and float it down, and they would then weld them together and put them together. Like one of the concerns with abandonment, with decommissioning now, is they don't know how the heck to get these things out. So they have to cut them up, they don't have cranes, they have to bring cranes I think from Korea to even manage part of it. So they've got an enormous issue. So a lot of things have happened to where if you cut them off, then leave part of them in there, you, you maintain some of the ecosystem. Uh, sometimes a lot of things that's used in the Gulf is where they'll topple them over. And any hard surface under the ocean, life will try to get grab a hold of in a variety of ways, as you all probably study. And so there is another conversation going on about that called Rigs to Reef. Now, I told you there were 23 platforms in federal waters and four in state. <coughs> there are um, also five man-made islands. Four of them are down off the coast of Long Beach, down there by the Queen Mary. This is one of them lit up at night. You can see it from shore. Uh, people mistake it for a, a, a high-end uh, high condo facility. <laughs> uh, there's also a waterfall on here. I think you can see it, I'm not sure, it's right over here. And people will call the oil companies and ask them to turn the waterfall on because they're having a party and they want to see it from shore, things like that. So it's coexisted somewhat aesthetically is what I'm, the point I'm trying to make. There are four islands down there. Um, the word thumb stands for Texaco, Humble, Union, Mobile, and Shell. There were five oil companies that got together to put these artificial islands, these rocks, contained rock structures in the water so that they have a flat platform in order to, to drill oil from. Those platforms, ironically, are owned by the state of California and the city of Long Beach now. The state of California and the city of Long Beach are actually oil companies. They produce that oil. They contract with a company called CRC, California Resources. People have made that video of that young man sleeping while all this stuff disappeared. 
Um, they actually operate and produce the oil for the city and the state. So this is what it looks like at night, one of them. And here's what it actually looks behind the scenes there. Oh, there's the waterfalls. See them? You see why people, when they're all lit up, people want to turn them on. And they think that tall tower there is a condo structure. It's actually hiding a drilling rig. The drilling rig is on a track and it moves. It can move. See the track? It moves all the way around the island, drill multiple drill, drills. Very ingenious. And there are four of those islands down there doing that. Then there's also, you've probably seen this one. This one's closer to home. This one's down by, um, down, down below Carpinteria, Rincon Island, you probably go by it. And it uh, looks like that from offshore. This is another one that's being abandoned through a bankruptcy and uh, the, the state and Arco Atlantic Richfield are working on that now. And here's what that looks like inside. And all the wells, and this one's a little different. What they did was they put, these are all wells in here that have been drilled and now they're, they're uh, they've got uh, what are called Christmas trees capped on the top where they can produce from. Those are tanks where they put the product and where they, where they ship it on. But that's what Rincon Island looks like. Now I wanna talk a little bit about natural seeps. Is anybody aware of the natural seeps off of the coast of California? I know you are. <laughs> Other people? Well, it's the second largest concentration of natural seeds in the world. The largest one is, I think, of uh, Azerbaijan, the Black Sea. So what you've got is California's been geologically active forever. All that oil was trapped down below. Something cracks, makes its way to the top. It's been doing that, both gas and oil oozing out, significant quantities. And we take people on seep tours. And if you have an overcast day, it's best because you can. it makes it look a lot better. Here's some information I pulled off of the State Land Commission website that the professor was talking about earlier today. So over a thousand barrels of oil each week seep out of those seeps on, by, by themselves. From Coal Oil Point, aptly named, which is by UCSB, uh, the surfers are all, they all get tar all over them all the time. From these natural seeps, 170 barrels a day maybe are in the ocean there. And there's at least 2,000 active seeps, oil and gas seeps. If you can go online, there's a professor, I forget his name, up in UCSB. He has a website, I think it's called Bubbleology, where he studies a lot of this stuff. And then there's a Crustal Studies program up there, if I'm not mistaken. And they, they've, been ex they've been studying, UCSB's been studying this stuff for quite some time. And if you think about it, so the oil and the gas is down there, and it's trapped. That's why it's down there. So there's a certain amount of pressure because it's trapped. So if you stick a straw in, a drilling rig, and you start reducing the pressure by pulling some of the oil out, then it, it stands to reason that you're gonna reduce the pressure that's pushing the natural seeps out. And sure enough, UCSB is studying it, and from, I've got a graph here in a minute, I'll show it to you. But this looks like a French Impressionism, doesn't it? That, that's funny, the gentleman who worked for Benico at the time, uh, his name was Mike Edwards, and we used to call him Monet Edwards. <laughs> he liked photography. Here's actually a bubble of the gas, the methane gas bubbling up. Here's more of it. And you go on the boat tours, you just take, I just took that picture there at the lake, but we're just by with the camera, just looking down over the boat. You can smell it, it kind of gives you kind of a nauseous feeling. Like I said, uh, this stuff's bubbling out naturally. As a matter of fact, um, Platform Holly uh, is sitting on top of one of the highest concentrations of these seeps. And if you've ever flown into Santa Barbara, it looks like Platform Holly had a blowout. It looks like it's leaking and people would go crazy and no, that's, that's natural. It's that significant. So here's kind of a little schematic of that to show you. You've got this, one of the main uh, formations that produces oil in California is called the Monterey Shale. You can see the Monterey Shale depicted in this, and you can see all the fractures in it. And so that's how these seeps make their way to the surface. Yes. Is, is there a difference in the composition between the oil that seeps out and the oil that's drilled out? Uh, there is a little bit. Funny you should ask that. Because people will go on the beach, 
the guitar and the feet. I go, oh my God, those oil companies are spilling oil. So the Office of Prevention, Oscar, they actually chemically signatured all of the oil being produced by mechanical means, and they, sig they chemically signatured the natural seeds. And so they know which, what the oil looks like in each respective case uh, so that they can identify that. They, so yes, there are chemical differences. I don't know if you want to weigh in on that. Yeah, so I'd say um, there, there are differences, but, but um, it, what tends to happen is what we get as the tar on the beach, uh, the stuff that at least sticks to your feet on the beach, which is mostly what, or, or on the uh, hillside or whatever, is mostly the thick stuff because the lighter stuff is volatized. So the stuff that's underground is, is, is not just that thick stuff, it's that thick stuff plus other things. Um, but uh, a lot of times the stuff that's coming out, it's coming from the same formation. And so the tr traditional way to fingerprint the um, oil is, is, so just like, so Bob had all those different pools, right? Each of those pools, there was a different, I don't know, chunk of ferns or microbes that, that died, right? So the, the isotopic signature and, and the composition of PAHs and all these different constituents is gonna be slightly different in each of those basins. Um, so one of the interesting problems when we, when we had the refugio spill, so what happened with the refugio spill was um, and we haven't talked about this, unfortunately, in this class because of the time, because of the, our two weeks of shuttering, but basically um, oil, oil spilled from, so we sucked oil out of, the, out of the ocean, right? Took it onto land, put it in this pipeline, it was going down the coast and then the pipeline broke open and so then that, that oil spilled onto the beach and then, and then it went to the ocean. So uh, a lot of it went out to, there was, a, there was an offshore wind, so the wind was blowing a lot of that, that stuff that was on the surface, at least initially, out to sea. And so at first people were like, ah, great, it's gone, right? Mm -hmm. And then a couple days later, we started getting, seeing lots of tar balls showing up in, in not next to the, where it spilled, but down the coast, Santa Barbara, uh, Ventura, Los Angeles, Manhattan Beach, all these places. And so the question became, are these tar balls from the refugio spill? And the answer was, don't know, have to check them. And so that gets into a much longer conversation about the politics of what happened with that stuff. But, but um, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a non-trivial thing to fingerprint these guys. So ultimately, um, we could. It ultimately showed that the at least some of, not all, but at least some of the tar balls that were showing up as far away as you know, southern Los Angeles County, most of the stuff in, in Ventura County was coming from that, that wellhead. But it, take, it took vi much more um, detailed processing, the sort of quick and dirty fingerprinting, it was hard to tell. We, we couldn't tell bec because um, the seeps were coming from the same formation. So it was, it was a much more challenging process. So people wanted to know like tomorrow, hey, is this tar ball coming from the spill? Why? Because if it came from the spill, Plains All-American was responsible for cleaning it up. If it wasn't their quote-unquote oil, if it was just some background oil that for whatever reason came in, that's not their responsibility. What Plains All-American did was they said, well, we're just gonna go under the, after a little bit, not initially, but after a little bit, they said, hey, we're gonna go under the assumption that all this stuff is our oil and we'll pay for it to clean up to avoid the, the political and legal ramifications if it, pr if it turned out that it was their oil, which it mostly was, um, that, that they didn't want to be seen as shirking their responsibility in the early days, right? Um, but but it, it took about a month and a half to actually get that information as to whether it, it truly was the chemical fingerprint of this stuff versus the other stuff. Does that make sense? Is that, okay. So here is uh, the Monterey Shale upended, exposed on the beach. sedimentary rock, right? The, the, notice the person in the background? This is off of the coast of Carpinteria. It's just oozing out of the ground. I don't think any of that big of it. I'm just asking you. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Although somebody showed me one picture of something that looked like that, but I think, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's real or not. Yeah. Now, so think about this. You've got, you got all this gas and oil bubbling up, right? And so in human ingenuity, it's like, well, that 
gas is bubbling up to the surface and it's releasing, it's going into the atmosphere. And that's something that is regulated, right? Air quality. So when the company was putting the, pro the platform Holly in, mobile, they were trying to find mitigations. In other words, how to offset, you know, to try to improve the environmental component to offset potentially some of the impacts maybe they were having. So ingeniously they thought, well, what if we find a way to capture those bubbles and keep them from going up into the air? And they built these two things that are called seat tents. And here's one of them. And you can see the people in the background there, so how big these things are. There's two of them sitting on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, I don't think they're being utilized right now, the cost effective, but they were designed to capture these bubbles that you saw earlier coming up and actually contain them and utilize them you know, as, a, as a gas source. So it's fascinating uh, engineering work. Here's a little kind of a drawing of, of what it looks like underneath a platform. Uh, they only have so many what are called drill slots because the platform's only so big and yet they need to go places because it's too difficult to put another platform in over here. So instead, using the technology of directional drilling, multiple well bores, they can drill multiple wells down out of the same basic hole and then turn them and go different places. And they, you can see this one is coming out over here. The world record, I think, right now is about nine miles. And it's held by ExxonMobil off the coast of California from one of, their, one of their platforms. Nine miles away, they were able to drill a well with the accuracy, now I'm understanding, it used to be of a, of a closet. Now I think it's within a cubic, it's like a cubic foot, a, a three feet by three feet cube, that they can hit something accurately. I don't know if you want to show Yeah, yeah, so, so you guys all get, we're, we're underwater, we're under, under yeah. we're looking up here, right? So we're looking up towards the surface and everything. And so, so the white are the, are the uh, well bores. And so, um, so, yeah, Bob's right, they're incredibly precise. So, um, like going to Mars type of technology. And so, for example, the, the best demonstration, in my opinion, recently was when the Deepwater Horizon happened. And in that case, the, the well that was going down to the ground, it wasn't capped properly. And so, essentially, it, it, it cracked open. And uh, they tried all this stuff. If you guys watch any of the old newsreels and stuff, everybody's talking about all these crazy things, Mexican hat, top hat junk shot, all this stuff to try to jam stuff in and stop up the, the tube, but there's too much pressure and none of that really worked. And then also some of the things we talked about, the, the super, super cold and the pressure, right, that we can get these, um, these frozen crystals of methane, natural gas, right, and we're talking about deep sea mining, that stuff actually gunked up the works, there's a bunch of complicating engineering things. So finally what they ended up doing was just going and drilling a, a, an additional well around, let's say, if it was that white thing there. So they brought another drill ship in, that the sister of the, of the ship that, um, of the platform that was used to, that failed, and they drilled down and then they spiraled around. So it actually corkscrewed, so the, the well, so they had that much control that they, they found it, they had magnetometers inside the tip of the drill bore and they wanted to make sure they were dead on, right? Because the pipe is only so big. And so they, they, they spiraled around, they corkscrewed around it, and then they got all the readings and they knew that, yes, this is indeed, this, there's a metal shaft in the middle of this corkscrew. And then when they were ready, like a, like a, a scorpion stinger, they kind of ding, and they stung it, right? And they, and they, they cut into that uh, well bore significantly below the, the seabed. And then they used that to inject all their sealant and to basically put their glue, if you will, and glue up the hole. And so that was all done by a, uh, how should we say this, an overweight gentleman sitting on a drill control ship um, doing it with remote control, with just like sort of like a, essentially like an Xbox controller type of thing. So that's how much control these guys have of being able to cut through rock and, and turn and go right and incredibly fine scale uh, control over the, these, these drilling, um, th these wellhead drill bores these days. So I have to ask, was there some reason why he needed to be overweight? Uh, all the pictures were, all the pictures where he just sat there and we're just drinking his uh, big gulp and he was uh, going to town. That's what he did all day long. That's what he did all day long. <laughs> so that's Benjamin Wild really. <laughs> it's true. So here's a, this is from, um, this is from UCSB. This, these are sonar profiles back in time. Just to give you an example of what Platform Holly did to the seeps by producing the oil 
that was, as I mentioned earlier, was, was creating pressure. And so you can see this is a, a histogram, I guess is the word for it, uh, from 1973 and then 1995 to show you. And over here you can see where the seat tents were placed. And Platform Holly was placed right over top of the high concentration, the highest concentration of seats. And they actually, for the most part, during that span of time, completely eliminated the seats in that area by reducing, by producing the oil. So if you take the oil out, there's less pressure, so there's less squeezing it out of the cracks is why there's less seeps, right? All right, rigs to reef. Everybody knows what that orange fish is, right? Garibaldi. Garibaldi. It's also called what? <laughs> it is a, and wh why, why is it important? State fish. The state saltwater fish. State marine fish. State marine fish. Trout. Which right. one? Brown trout? No, I don't know. All right, you get an A. You get a trout. <laughs> he works on saltwater stuff. He doesn't okay. do that. Well, you got it, though. It's a golden trout. Brown, gold. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're completely. I'm a fly fisherman, sorry. So, um, Basically, these pictures over here to the right, I wanted to tell you a story, getting back to the reef, the reef issue. There has been one example, and it was a fascinating political one at the Coastal Commission that I was participating in. So there was this pier remnant off the coast up there by Platform Holly in that area. What, what year? What year are we talking? Uh, gosh, this must have been 2006 or seven, maybe, something like that. I need to go back and find out. So, uh, Atlantic Richfield, ARCO, VP, said, okay, well, we'll get rid of it. And, but if you notice, there's all these little birds sitting on there. And the birds are the California brown pelican and the Brent cormorant. And it was one of the areas on the coast, one of the, within like 60 or 70 miles, that they were able to roost. So there's a very interesting dilemma here, because on one hand, there were entities like Santa Barbara County and um, the Environmental Defense Center, some other folks who didn't want to set a precedent for okaying a reefing of an oil component. They don't want to do it. They don't want to set any precedent because those big platforms are going to take them the hell out. So you had that group. And then you also had a California State Fishing Game, and you had the Audubon Society, and others who were going, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Because what ARCO BP proposed to do was take those out and put artificial roost back up so that the birds would still have a place to, to set. So you had this interesting political dynamic where you had half the folks who didn't want to create any kind of goodwill that you could, the oil companies could, to, could take any of these things and make something good out of them. And you had the other group saying, well, but we want to save the habitat. So it was interesting. I was at that hearing, and uh, BP said, we don't care, whatever you want to do, we'll do either one, basically. And so the coastal commissioners, all 13 of them, they were having fun, back and forth, trying to figure this out. One of them even said, well, if we go ahead and approve this, can we condition the permit so that BP or ARCO can't talk about it, can't put it in any kind of, and can't even say they did it. And they asked the, the, the head of the coastal commission, the staff, head staffer at the time, and, he looked over at the lawyer, and the lawyer said, no, I think that's a free speech right. You can't really do that. So just to illustrate how torn they were. Right? So they did condition the permit, though, to say that once they took them out, and they put the artificial stanchions back up, if the birds didn't come back within six months, they had to take them out. The birds were back, I think, in two or three weeks or something. So if you go there, there are artificial stanchions, and the California brown pelican and branch cormorant are nesting on them to this day. So that's an interesting example of at least a, a beginning point to the discussion that you're coming upon in your work about this reefs to reef thing with abandonment. So I find that, found that politics very fascinating. So underneath these platforms, as I mentioned before, uh, we call them hidden oasis. There's a professor at UCSB, Dr. Milton Love, who has been studying rockfish habitats. A lot of these platforms, they're nurseries for fish. The fish can go inside there and kind of be protected from getting eaten. They've got a safe haven. You've got all these different uh, animals that attach themselves to things. Uh, you've got the shell, the, the, uh, uh, what's the, what's the main 
shellfish that's on there. Uh, oysters? Well, oysters. Mussels? Mussels. And then when they die, they drop off and they go down to the bottom and eventually they create a shell mound. And the shell mound is important because for scavengers like lobsters and other things, you've got these various stages of ecosystems. And so, uh, you know, there's that to consider. Uh, but to know that the fishermen fish nearby all the time because that's where all the fish are around these platforms. And so it's an interesting issue from a, a reaping point of view. So one of the terms for, so in, in a, we've mentioned that the structure of the ocean, right, is three-dimensional and that what doesn't seem like us to maybe have a whole lot of structure may well be a huge amount of structure for a jellyfish or, or a critter like that. Um, but also for these bigger bodied things, for these nekton, so the fish and whales and stuff, um, so solid structures really do matter, right? Because the whales can go, or the whatever, the tuna can go through those, those uh, isoclines or those thermoclines or whatever they are, right? Um, so, so it turns out uh, if you drop anything in the water, in the open ocean, some things will dig on it. And so the general term for that is a fish aggregating device or an FAD. And so sometimes fishermen will throw the, like tuna fishermen or something will throw them in the water and, and leave them as an attractant kind of thing. And so that's essentially what this is. So some things are queuing off of the food or the, the habitat that Bob is talking about, but other things are queuing off of the fact that it looks like there's some other things there, right? So, so once that starts uh, initially, it's a pretty quick snowball to a bunch of stuff being there. And then you have recruitment of sessile organisms like these mussels, like these oysters, like the barnacles and whatever. And so then when they're there, it just leads this sort of riotous thing. And so for us, that sounds like a good thing, right? For the oil companies, that's maybe not so great because these are engineered that when the water flows by them, there's only so much drag, right? They're not engineered to be three times the diameter with additional additional bumpiness and all this and that. So there's this debate or this, this ongoing tension between uh, all the cool critters that are attracted and then engineeringly making sure that the platform is robust and is not being overly torqued or overly uh, uh, stressed out kind of thing. And, and some of the work, it's, it's still unclear, but some of the work is showing that these actually might be really important for some critters dispersing to the islands and back. So some critters that need habitat like some rockfish and stuff like that. Um, so some things say tuna, the tuna are fine going across blue water and they're just chilling, right? Other guys, maybe they don't feel so good. They might be smaller or younger life history stages or something. And if they're just cruising around, they might be chomped by somebody else. So um, there's some hypotheses out there that these platforms have acted as something of a step stone for organisms on the island to get back to the mainland or the mainland to disperse to the island. And, and are helping with some connectivity issues in terms of dispersal and, and recruitment dynamics of the offshore uh, Channel Islands. Thank you. You kind of know about some of this stuff, huh? <laughs> Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Is there a risk of the decommissioned rigs failing because of the added things going on? Well, that's a good question. One of the things, uh, getting back to his point, you know, the the all of the things that attach themselves to the legs. There was a company that was making a, a business mm -hmm. out of vacuuming those muscles and all off those platform legs. And you could actually go to Brophy Brothers in Santa Barbara and eat them. And, and actually people preferred them, I guess, because of the out in the deep water and all of that. So yes, there's a, there, uh, what they do is they use um, electrical current through cathode, anode, to actually uh, keep the, the corrosion, et cetera, from those legs. And so I would imagine, just as he's saying, the drag and all of that, if they were left there. Um, but then again, if you're not having an operation and the well's already abandoned, to what extent, I don't know that's an issue or not. Uh, if it falls over, and what's it fall over on? But, I don't know, it's kind so, of a... So, so the, the oil companies, just to be clear, when, when these structures go in, they, they agreed that when they were done with their useful lifespan of the Mm -hmm. of the oil and gas field, that at the end of that, obviously the well heads would be capped and, and sealed so they wouldn't leak, but then all of the stuff above the bottom of the ocean would be removed. So that's what, that's what they're legally required to do. So all this stuff that Bob's talking about, this, this rigs to reef, and oh my God, there's a bunch of animals there and sessile organisms, that wasn't really understood until like the 80s, basically. Right. And so, so this is an interesting case where the 
oil companies by and large, and Bob can correct me, are like, yeah, it's all good. If we're done, we'll cut it off and we'll take it away. But as he did described with the, with the bird platforms, some groups are like, whoa, 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 maybe we don't want to do that. But then you're into this whole weird territory, right? So if you cut these whole things off, uh, some people will say you're screwing with the fish habitat, right? If you leave them, there'll be some Yahoo tech diver that wants to go dive on these things, and we'll go dive on them, and then we'll get tangled up and die, right? And then sue the people for making an attractive nuisance or something like that, right? So there's all kinds of knock-on effects. Again, this is the story in California. Completely different story for those of you that had come with us to Louisiana or those of you that are going with us to Louisiana. Completely different story there. There, they're more like, oh, we're supposed to take them out? Sorry, don't want to. See you later. So, so this story that we're talking about is very much, while the concept is universal, uh, um, I would say the debate here is better. <laughs> the, the, the management discussion here is, is more elevated than in other parts of yeah. the oil and gas production and world. And it's been going on for some time. I know I've been involved in some of it with, uh, with uh, the agency formerly called MMS. It's now Boeing. So I'm going to kind of hurry through here because I'm running out of time and I do want to get to some of this stuff. So WISPA stands on decarbonizing California. I'm going to give you kind of a brief, real quick rundown just to give you a flavor of some of the things that we're working on. Upstream means producing the oil, getting it out of the ground. Upstream refiners are downstream. Just assume it's a, you know, from point, point A to point B. And so we call them upstream statewide. Senate Bill 4 had to do with study, better understanding well stimulation, which is hydraulic fracturing. So there's a whole host of issues around that. Want to know when it, there was a, there's a permit structure created. Uh, we're looking at air monitoring when someone does a fracture stimulation job to see if there's any impacts to air. We're looking at monitoring the groundwater. Uh, the CCST, which is the California Council on Science and Technology, is an independent scientific body, a collection of scientists from Lawrence Berkeley and Lawrence Livermore Laboratories that help the state bring science to the discussion. Uh, DTSC is an acronym for the Department of Toxic Substances, and they are wondering if when this fluid that we put down to hydraulically fracture or stimulate the wells, when it comes back up, are there some, is it a waste stream, a hazardous waste that needs to be dealt with? So there's all these regulations that, and I deal with all of these. This is one of the things I do in my spare time. And um, the underground injection control, re-injecting that water back down in the ground. There's a whole bunch of a series of, of issues around that that we're doing. The wells that aren't working anymore, to make sure they're properly abandoned for history. There's a whole set of regulations around that. These are all being updates. The SGMA is, a, is the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. In short, what is going to be happening in California is that when you take water out, you're gonna to have to make sure that there's water back there somehow. Basically, keep everything in a zero-sum game. And then well construction standards, again, putting the working on the wells, making the wells, making sure. See, periodically what happens, it's not that people are doing something wrong, it's that technology evolves and understanding evolves, just like with the rigs to reef. So, okay, is there something else we can be doing that might bring something better to this, more cost-effective, more technically superior? So a lot of the regulatory issues are really looking at the existing regulations and seeing if they're still workable, do they need fix, do they need enhancement, uh, are some parts of them not working. So I deal with a lot of that. And then in Santa Barbara County and Ventura County, some of the issues we've been talking about all day here, the Plains Pipeline, the restart, either repair or replace it. I mentioned about the ExxonMobil interim trucking proposal. There are other projects onshore. Era Energy has a project to produce more oil in northern Santa Barbara County. A company called Vaquero does as well. There are some other companies. So there, there's some active uh, opportunities to try to, to produce more of our own oil under CEQA, et cetera, through the permitting process. And then Ventura County, some of the issues that are going on. The professor is actually working on, on uh, the implementation. I'll get to it in a minute of AB 617. But uh, the general plan is being updated, so that's a con conversation about oil because it has to do with the economics of the area. They're looking at uh, connectivity with a wildlife habitat corridor, very important issue. I'm working all of these issues. Zoning clearances, conditional use permit issues, 
where somebody wants to add a well to a project, what's that process look like, what do we need to analyze, How, what, et cetera, et cetera. And there's some projects going forward in Ventura County as well. So there's some, a lot of activity going on onshore. That was the speed of light. <laughs> uh, SAB, Assembly Bill 398. This was a, as you can see here, uh, with a bipartisan passage, California State Legislature gave direction to the California Air Resources Board on how to design the state's cap and trade program. I'm gonna oversimplify cap and trade. If, so, if a company or an entity caps its emissions below what it's required to, then it creates what are called offsets, which are credits because they did better than they thought than they were required to, and then they can trade those offsets to somebody who can't do that. The whole basis of the plan isn't to keep things at some level, but to continue to ratchet it so we get increased, increased improvement to the air quality relative to the, a lot of the climate change. Of, of yeah, that's right. That's right. Yep. Okay. The legislature in, 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 a, in a free market uh, context, free market setting, so you can exactly. trade it to whoever wants to buy it. And there are exchanges, and they have to be of a certain quality and grade, and all these things. It's all regulated. The legislature directed CAR, California Air Resource Board, to establish cost containment features such as price ceilings, place a limit on high allowance. Come go. They're kind of looking at the free market and saying, okay, there may be some problems. Let's see what we can do. Uh, some speed bumps to trigger the sale of additional allowances instead of people holding them and hoarding them. <laughs> so uh, in order to reduce the market volatility. So that's kind of, they came and they looked at this program and they did a lot of improvements. But on a parallel track, it was also brought up Assembly Bill 617, which uh, basically, it's a companion bill to that, but it was to address air quality and disproportionately impacted communities. And your professor is working with a local entity in Ventura County on their efforts to basically ground truth that, to look at those emissions and to see if the disadvantaged communities or the areas of what's happening there and, and uh, try, to, try to inform the discussion going forward and the regulations based on data. SB 100. Uh, SB 100 is an acceleration of the renewable portfolio standard, which means more and more renewables into our energy mix, into producing our electricity in particular. So you can see California, it accelerates California's current mandate, which is to achieve 50% of its electricity from renewable sources from 2030 up to 2026, so accelerated that. In addition, it established that California is going to generate 60% by 2030, in other words, four more years, it's gonna be 10% more, and then 100% by 2045. Now, these are goals. It'll be interesting to see how we get there. That's a pretty amazing goal. Uh, our industry, we're in there digging in, trying to help them, help them work on it. We have some reservations that some of this stuff is just not realistic and we're concerned about what it's gonna do in the here and now, but we're a constructive, collaborative player in that discussion. In conclusion, so I like to say, are we gonna be flying around in solar planes tomorrow? I don't think so. Here's what I said earlier. Here's a kind of a graphic illustration of this thing about energy. We're still gonna be using the same amount of fossil fuels in 2040, and also it's gonna include a 12% increase in demand. So that's a fact, that's not me here saying that, that's a fact that we all need to understand and we need to have it inform our discussions around energy. And I've got this little uh, syllogism, I guess, a logical argument that, that basically I think encapsulates or frames this, this ending conversation. If we're gonna need petroleum for the foreseeable future, and I just showed you the federal government said we are, and we have plenty of it right here, we went through all of that, the reserves, right? And we have the most stringent environmental regulations on the planet. I don't think anybody can argue that California doesn't have the most <laughs> stringent environmental regulations anywhere. And yet we're giving our money to other countries who they don't like us very much, where the environmental regulations are not as stringent. This kind of frames the discussion I want you to walk away to ponder, because this is what is happening. We're buying fuel from over the ocean, we're transporting it here, we're not benefiting it from it environmentally or economically, and so that needs to filter into that conversation of why are we still importing 60 some percent of our oil? So, does anybody know who said this? 
This is the Jerry Brown quote. This is the Jerry Brown quote. Even in their Priuses, he said that. Is that the plural form of Prius? You know, I don't know. It's a pre I pre- I don't know. It could be. pre I. Yeah. <laughs> Did anybody ever see the, the South Park episode? <laughs> Smug Cloud? I see it in San Francisco. That was a hoot. <laughs> All right. So this is what he said. So, you know, God bless the governor. I think he understood. And yet he got vilified. A lot of the environmental community didn't like him, don't like him. They think he was, they, they thought he was being paid off by us. Really, I think he was looking at the situation like I'm trying to give you a perspective on and say, well, you know, here's the conclusion I reach. He also, um, I didn't put it in here, but it gets back to the comment you were talking about. He also articulates that we're dumping our environmental impacts in these third world countries. He says that's another part of this quote. All right, so here's what I want to suggest to you. We at the oil industry, we want to have a conversation with people about energy. And yet, there's a lot of folks that don't even want to talk to us, want us just to go away. Well, the reality is, no matter what you kick or scream or yell, you need us to produce the oil for now as we go forward. So there's a reality here. So what we've decided is we need to figure out how to reach out and have that conversation. And with people who maybe don't want to have that conversation, right? And so we're trying to kind of put a perspective on this. So uh, I think we can all agree the world is changing. We're at a tipping point. Our energy mix is evolving, right? We're bringing on more and more renewables, alternatives. We're expanding our energy mix. There's an increasing demand for energy. I showed you that just in the United States with that 12% going up. There's increasing pressures on the environment. More and more people. We're going to have 10 billion people on the planet here real soon. Our economy and our way of life depend on energy. I showed you all the things oil's made out of, right? Rising populations. And they're all demanding that we approach our shared future intentionally together. So how do we change our mindset? Well, we gotta find some common ground, right? Some things we can agree on. And an open debate is healthy. Instead of screaming at each other or talking over each other, what if we start by agreeing on some of the questions that we need to talk about? And uh, one of them is the four E's here. How do we balance equality, energy, the economy, and the environment into a sustainable future? To be in denial that petroleum is not going to be a part of it for the foreseeable future, side rails that conversation completely. Whatever conclusion you come to is not going to fit because you need the energy that it produces for now. So how can we make that public discourse more civil and inclusive, not devices? These are some of the questions that we're grappling with. What impacts are energy sources having on the environment? How do we improve them? Where can we be partnering more effectively with the scientific community? One of the things is a lot of the work you're doing is just fantastic how you're bridging right with the oil industry to try to sort this out. And what does that future energy mix look like and how do we make it sustainable? And it's important that we are a part of the conversation because as humbly as I can tell you, we're the energy experts, we're the ones. If you're gonna exclude us from the conversation, we're the ones that all of the oil companies, I don't know if you know, they're all involved in all these other energies. Exxon is looking at uh, algae, uh, I mean, these companies are energy companies. Uh, a lot of them are invested in solar, wind, all these things. They're trying to figure this stuff out. So shouldn't we be a part of that conversation? And what if our, the four P's, I call it, what if our people are planning our prosperity? Where's the other P? It's on the other side. <laughs> Support each other instead of competing against each other. We need to figure out how we can have that conversation. So here's what we believe that our people, oh here it is, there's the progress. I left the other key up. <laughs> our people, our planet, our prosperity, our progress toward a sustainable future. You know, we all need to be involved in that conversation. Because we're, we're, we're committed to a sustainable energy future, empowering the future energy mix. We know we have a critical role to play. We're partnering with as many people as we can to try to encourage that discourse. We're calling out potentially damaging policy changes that threaten the Four E's I mentioned earlier. We have serious concern about this goal of 100% by 2045. We just think it's gonna have some unintended consequences and we'd like to continue to have the conversation and we will. 
So, and we want to share our experience, our expertise, as we wrestle with these issues. We're, you know, who, who better to help than people who have been producing the energy? So this is kind of my, my lobbying at the end here. So we are going to disagree on stuff. And we're divided by politics, but we all share the same future, don't we? So our people, our planet, our prosperity, and our progress toward a sustainable energy future are best served by a dialogue that includes everybody at the table. Oh, I left a T out there. Take a seat. And just to show you, we're not just mouthing this, we are, we are internalizing it. This is our corporate room up in Sacramento. We've got it on the wall. So we are, you know, we're, gonna, we're walking the walk. We, and we wanna invite you to talk with us and we're gonna continue to talk with you. Let's have an honest discussion. Let's have a discussion about the facts. And then from there, let's have a discussion about what our concerns are and how we can address them. Because we're, we're here and we're gonna be here and it'll sure go a lot better if you let us be at the table with you. I wanna leave you with one thing. One of the things I created a couple of years ago here on the coast, and I brought one of these for everybody. Would you mind helping me pass this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. are in my backpack here and I'm coming right in on wire here, I think. There's a, how many students do I got? About 40 of them. Oh, yeah. Here, here they are. I'll just get them out. There's more. I'll go to the other side. This is a little pamphlet to start that conversation. If you look on the back of this booklet, you'll see that there's a lot of questions. Questions we should be asking ourselves. And I'll just recite them. What would our lives be without energy? I think we kind of saw. What, how critical is it to your quality of life? about essential. Where do we get our energy today? You guys know that answer now, right? Where do we come from tomorrow? Good question. Why is it so important? This little booklet is twofold. Kind of put this together for you to keep with you. It's an advocacy handbook. The first half of it goes over a lot of the things that I talked about today, but it also talks about the advantages and the disadvantages of all the forms of energy, because none of them is a silver bullet. How many of you have gone on, on Interstate 15 to Las Vegas? All right, right there at the state line, did you see that giant solar place? Mm -hmm. It's the largest solar facility in the world. It's called Ivanpah. Well, those are not solar panels there. Those are mirrors. And what they do is they focus the sun's energy up to those three towers. You guys seen this? Mm -hmm. Did you also see there's like a little mist about halfway up? What's that? Bubbles of bird. Yeah, I'll get to the birds. <laughs> <laughs> that mist is the condensation of the water in the, in the desert atmosphere. That's so much heat being focused up to those towers. The first thing, I'll give you a plug, the first 20-some percent of the generator needs to be powered by natural gas in order for it to work. Uh, but then they use that solar. But one of the disadvantages is you got to the, the birds. Birds fly through there, and if you go online, they're called streamers. And you can see videos on YouTube. They blow up. We're talking about owls and hawks and eagles and all these birds blow up. So I'm not trying to poo-poo that project. The bottom line is there, there's advantages and disadvantages to everything and they have impacts. So just be mindful of that. So the first half has to do with that. It talk, it's got the graphs I showed you, a lot of the takeaways. And then the second half really is a, is a coastal way to get engaged if you want to get engaged in the conversation, about the energy conversation. It tells you about your elected officials, tells you kind of in a rudimentary way how to advocate, whether you want to send letters, whether you want to go to hearings, whatever. But this is a little pocket advocacy book we put together uh, through the Coastal Energy Alliance to try to help foster everybody to join the conversation. So I've got a bunch of handouts over here, by the way, that on a lot of the things I've talked about, feel free to take them. And otherwise, unless you have any questions, I'm done. Cool.